kingdom come, as you know, and this is installment number 14. And we've been looking at a people under God. And here we are at the final installment of that. And we're looking at a nation under God. Hallelujah. Last week we looked at what? A church under God. And we said that the church exists for three reasons. Number one, the exaltation of God. Number two, the edification of the people. And number three, the evangelization of the word. The church exists for the exaltation of God, the edification of the people, and the evangelization of the word. We agreed that as times have evolved, the evangelization of the word is looking more and more different in its execution than it used to be. Where those days crusades were the norm, we just come, would put our loudspeakers uh, speakers outside, we show a theme or something, and we'll gather people together, and people will give their lives to Jesus. It is no longer enough. Hallelujah. Amen. And so more and more and more, God is requiring foot soldiers, people who will go to the different spheres of government, people who will go to the different places of authority, people who will go to the different um, hospitals, the, uh, the schools, the, the business places, the boardrooms people in the police force, people in the army, people in the air force, people in the navy, sons of God who would show up in these places and have kingdom, hallelujah. And what they do in their interpersonal relationships, in one-on-one -on -one relationships, is they put Jesus on display. That is how evangelism is happening now. It's more and more and more personal and influence. Amen. We're preaching the gospel less and less and less with the words, and we're just preaching with our lives. And that is why we must understand this concept of a people, overall concept of a people under God, and why, a, you know, last Sunday, especially, a church under God was important. When I started to teach that last Sunday, I told us that it doesn't even make sense to caption the, mas the message, a church under God. Because a church is supposed to be under God. But we agreed also that more and more and more there are churches who are not under the God of heaven. And so we must become a people who are conscious enough to look in the environment we go to. If you enter the world, don't just sit down and be carried away by the music or the ambience. Sit down and listen with your spirit and be sure that this place is a church under God. Hallelujah. So we find that we cannot be effective unless we, as the church of Jesus Christ, have administered our affairs properly with the word of God, which is the standard of heaven. Which means that every person in the church who gets out on Monday through Saturday represents God in their different spheres of assignment or endeavor, and they are God's tools for establishing the kingdom. It is the point of our scripture in Matthew chapter 6, in verse number 10, that kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hallelujah. And so this means that nations must become, this means that, uh, that, that nations must, must come under the power of God as well, or come under the authority of the word of God. Otherwise, if the people cannot thrive individually because they are not under the word of God, and the families are not thriving because they are not under the word of God, and the churches are not thriving under, unless they are under the word of God, ultimately the nation cannot thrive because the nation is a collective of all these people. And so whether you think that a nation is a secular nation, i.e. is a nation that has no allegiance or affiliated to any kind of religion, or the nation is affiliated to a religion, is every nation must be under God for all of these things to work. Hallelujah. So caveat number one, I want you to pay attention to me, please. I'm not here confused. Neither am I presumptuous that every nation under the earth will name Jesus as its Lord as Savior. But here's the thing that makes this beautiful. We would really like for every nation under the earth to declare that Jesus is Lord. And I'm hoping and I'm praying because the Bible says that the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters covers the sea. And that day we come. 
But until that day comes, it doesn't matter who a nation bows to, that nation must administer their affairs by the standard of God. Otherwise, it cannot thrive. Remember that when we started this, I said to us that what's causing the confusion is in the earth is that we are very many doing what we want to do, but very few of us are bowing to the standard of God. And so it doesn't matter whether they invent a new political system. And they say, oh, this is the system that they use in heaven, paraventure. If it gets to the earth, unless the men and women on the earth are bowed before God, that system will be corrupted like that. Hallelujah. I know because every, every Sunday or leading to every Sunday when I prepare this particular series, I'm asking myself, Stabi, isn't there, isn't, are there no issues at the well individually that you should be focused on? Why are you dealing with this? Because whatever issue we are going through individually, a chunk of it is linked to how our governments are doing. Do you get it? A lot of it is linked to how our societies are structured. So in the end, whether we like this conversation or we don't like it, whether we believe in this conversation or we don't believe in it, it is a conversation that the church must continue to have. You know why? I told you why. Because the church is the one that has the words of life. So if we do not teach these things from here, who's going to teach it? If we do not align with these things, who's going to align with them? Praise Jesus. Consequently, we can no longer have a church with dim lights and expect our nations to shine bright. Let me say that one more time. We can no longer have a church with dim lights and expect that our nations will shine bright. Turn to your neighbor and say it is better to be raised than to just grow up. Turn to the neighbor on the other side. Say, I said it is better to be raised than to just grow up. Because I'm teaching a nation under God today. And y'all, are you ready for me? Eh? I want us to rise on our feet. We're going to take the national anthem. Hallelujah. It's a nation under God. And we must learn to do things properly. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Play it. Um, if, are you playing the audio? Anything you want, and when you receive it, you celebrate. Sorry? It because that tasty grilled chicken is here, and that key ingredient just in time. Other Nigeria, we hate it. Our Do tribe and tongue may differ in brotherhood we stand. I all and proud to serve our sovereign motherland. Our flag shall be a symbol that truth and justice reign in peace over to all Lord, and this we count as gain to hand on to our children Hallelujah. Yes, clap if you want to. <laughs>
Hallelujah. I said clap. <laughs> Hallelujah. I know you don't believe one word of what you sang. And the sad part is, if you don't believe it, it will be unto you according to your faith. That's just the way it works. So you better believe it and you better get behind it. May God grant you grace in Jesus' name. Please be seated. God bless you. Open quickly to Psalm number 24. Psalm number 24. Psalm number 24 in verse number 1 to 2. Brethren, please um, stop your buying and selling or I'll begin to mention your names. Stop it. Thank you. We're moving on and I want us to open to Psalm number 24. In verse 1 to 2. In the New King James translation, it reads, it's all, no, I want to read the Amplified Classic. It says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness of it. The world and they who dwell in it. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the currents and the rivers. Hallelujah. If you read it in the message translation, it says righteousness, um, sorry, um, that's fine. Let's stay with um, just the Amplified Classic. Let's open quickly to Proverbs chapter number 14. Proverbs 14, I want us to read verse number 34. Proverbs chapter 14, verse number 34. Proverbs 14, 34. In the New King James translation, please. It says, righteousness exalts a nation. But sin is a reproach to any people. If you read it in the message translation, it says, God devotion makes a country strong. God avoidance leaves people weak. If you read it in the King James translation, it says, righteousness exalted a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. The thing I want you to see in those scriptures is none of those scriptures said righteousness exalts a Christian nation. <laughs> none of it says righteousness exalts a Muslim nation. It just says that righteousness exalts a nation and sin is a reproach to that nation. I like the message translation because it's closer to home. It says God's devotion makes a country strong and God's avoidance leaves people weak. Tell me which nation on the earth today isn't weak. Christians' nations weak. Islamic nations weak. The few purely secular nations weak. Why is that so? So this is not about I went to church, I went to the mosque. This is about a standard that the God of heaven who created the heavens and the earth had ordained. The scripture we read in Psalm 24 says the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. It goes on to say, say because he founded it. Unless you founded a nation, you cannot determine the standard by which that nation would be ruled. If you are the one that founded the nation, then you can say this is how I want my nation to be ruled. But as you did not found it, if you want that nation to thrive, you have to go back to the one who founded it and say to him, how do you want this nation to thrive? Think about it. Samsung are the ones that created this phone. Or yes, manufactured this phone. If something is wrong with my Samsung phone, I don't take it to the farmer in my village, the guy, the mechanic who repairs the bicycles in my village. My best bet is to take it to Samsung or take it to a Samsung-trained person who understands the phone so that they can tell me what it is. The first thing to do when your phone goes anything is to first troubleshoot according to the manual. Even before you escalate it to a professional who would not now open it and look at it. Am I correct? How many of us take our phones, you know, even if it's a techno phone, even if it's an Ahuja phone, do you take it to somebody who has never seen a phone before? Who do you take it to? Why do we take our earth, this space and everything in it that God committed into your hand, 
Why are we handing it to quacks? Men are telling us how we should run in the earth that God created. And these men are not bound to God. And you expect that what they are telling us to do will work. When was the last time that a mechanic told you how to deliver a baby and it worked? The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and they that dwell in it. He has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the currents and the rivers. Because the earth belongs to God, the rulership or the standard by which the earth will be ruled is in the manual that God gave us. What's that manual? The word of God. Hallelujah. I know this, in your mind, you'll be like, this does not put food on my table. <laughs> if you did not put food on your table, dollar would be equivalent to a naira today. The reason why the things that are happening are happening is because we are a nation under everything but God. I'm going to be teaching this, you know, I'm teaching for the entire world, but I'm teaching because I'm in Nigeria and I have only a green passport. So before I begin to teach again, let me say that most nations claim that they are secular countries. Which means that they say that they, are no, they have no pledged allegiance to any religion. Even Nigeria on paper claims that they're not a religious state. That's what Nigeria says. But I checked something out today. I had to look at um, um, the um, population review, world population review um, grading for secularism. And it says that Nigeria is in, their, in the secularism um, score. Nigeria scored 45.97. That's a fail. So Nigeria is not a secular state. Instead, Nigeria is a multi-religious state. Do you understand this? Now, again, I'm talking from the Bible. But here's the thing. Even if somebody bowed to Igbe, they better ad administer their things by Igbe properly. That's why the Bible says, it says the one that is your master, Praise Jesus. Which means that by the world standard, if Nigeria scored 45 point something, by the standard of the words of the word and nations that claim to be secular, Nigeria is not exactly a secular state. So it's only ignorant people that walk on our streets and say, eh, you don't know what you're saying. And because you don't know what you're saying, anyhow is how you'll be doing. And because you're doing anyhow, Anyhow is how you will see. But that said, I'm teaching today, not like I'm teaching about a Christian nation. I'm teaching today about Nigeria from the Bible as a secular nation. I give it to them that their paper qualification is correct, that we are a secular nation. I agree today. But here's the point. That secular nation did not found itself. It's not Lord Lugard and so that founded. Nigeria existed before Lord Lugard and all the others came. And until we begin to ask the one that created the heaven and the earth, what did you have in mind when you created this nation? What is it that is the standard by which this nation will run? <laughs> so the big idea of today's message is that even when nations insist that they are secular, they are not exempted from living and administering their governance as under God. Hallelujah. The reason for this is simple. Regardless of who the administrator is, or who the leader, or who the president, or the prime minister of a nation is, regardless of his religious affiliations or lack thereof, the code of conduct for good human beingness came out of God's word. Before any constitution said, said that murder is a sin, the Bible had said it, thou shalt not kill. Before any constitution said that adultery is a sin, the Bible had said it, thou shalt not covet your brother's wife or your neighbor's wife. Before any constitution said stealing is a sin, the Bible has already said it, thou shalt not steal. 
So any which way, the constitutions flow from the standards that the divine one has set. The God of heaven. And so when we do it for a minute and then 10 minutes, we say we don't want to do it. So thou shall not steal only works when somebody is taking what is your own. Thou shall not steal does not work when you are taking another person's own. How are we going to strive? How are we going to do that? Do you understand this? So the big idea again is that regardless of what you claim that you are in the nation, the code of conduct for being a good human being is distilled from the word of God. So whether you believe in God, we're not telling you to come to heaven. If you don't want to come, it's your choice. It would be nice if you came because then you won't burn in hell. But if you don't want to come, it's a choice that is, you are totally allowed to make. What you cannot do is because you want to go to hell, you make my own life hell. Do you understand that? So you may say you don't believe in God. Okay, shall I don't steal what belongs to me? Shall I don't kill my brother? Shall I don't oppress? It's okay. Your eternity is yours to decide where you will spend it. Is this making sense? I know some will be like, this is really callous. Are we not supposed to be bringing people to the kingdom? I really want you to come to give your life to Jesus. Honestly, I do. But I'm saying, if you don't want to go, don't use your own to spoil my own. Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. Verse 3 to 5. In the, I guess I'll read it in the New King. Is it the New King James or the Amplified Classic? I want to read it. Uh, the Amplified Classic. The Amplified Classic. Romans chapter number 13 from verse 3 to 5. For civil authorities, actually I want to read from verse 1. Let everyone be loyally subject to the governing civil authorities for there is no authority except from God by his permission his sanction and those that exist do so by God's appointment therefore he who resists and sets himself up against the authorities resists what God has appointed and arranged in divine order and those who resist will bring down judgment upon themselves receiving the penalty due to them. For civil authorities are not a terror to people of good conduct, but to those of bad behavior. <laughs> Would you have no dread of him who is in authority? Then do what is right and you will receive his approval and commendation. For he is, this is where I want you to pay attention the most. For the one that is in authority, he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, you should dread him and be afraid. For he does not bear and wear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant to execute, execute his wrath. That is his punishment and vengeance on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be subject to not only to avoid God's wrath and escape punishment, but also as a matter of principle and for the sake of conscience. Hallelujah. So, listen very carefully to me. You are not going to like me in the next two minutes, and that is okay. Your Muslim president is God's servant. You don't like me right now. But I'm not going to change the Bible or rewrite it. Your local government chairman that has 14 shrines in his house is God's servant. That's what the Bible says. Because the Bible does not qualify. The one that is doing my will is my servant. The one that is not doing my will is my servant. The Bible is clear. As it doesn't matter how they got there. 
And some of you say, how does it not matter how they got there? Because the heaven and the earth, that's the first scripture I read to you. The earth and the fullness thereof, and they that dwell therein belong to God, yes? So if somebody was God's enemy, and God didn't want him to get there, God knows what to do. If God did not block their way, God sent them. You don't like me right now. And that's okay. Because if I wanted to be like, I'll go to where they lie. Because everybody there will say they like me, even though I know it's a lie. Do you understand this? A nation that is under God does not need to necessarily have churches everywhere. It just needs to administer its affairs by the standard of not many things, the Ten Commandments. Is this making sense? He is God's servant. You mean? Ben, you. Name any name. Let's not call Nigerian names. Call Putin. Call any name. He is God's servant. Because it says every authority. It didn't say some authority. I'm going to liberate someone because some of us is the reason why we're not receiving even in the nation. Because you're not receiving from the land because you're so angry with what the systems that God has set in place in this season. So God is saying you are angry with everything I have put in place. You can't receive. Your job is if you don't like how it is doing, the only instruction that God said you should do is pray. Say pray for them. Pray for them. Continue to pray for them. I need you to understand that the Bible says we should pray for them because the Bible knew that some of them have the proclivity not to do what is right. Am I correct? If not, why do they need prayer? If they were just going to come and be doing everything the way they need to do them, we won't be praying for them. We'll just be blessing them. You know? So the, even the Bible knew that some of them will reach their use, being used their head worker. The Bible did not say that they will be nice. That they will be right all the time. But he says praise for them. Unless the church of Jesus Christ understands that responsibility. God help us. The point of this scripture that I read to you in Romans chapter 13 is simple. Those in civil authority, they represent God. To administer his standards to society. They are his servants and they are his ministers. Important, I want you to hear this. Regardless of their religious affiliations or the lack thereof, they still have the responsibility to carry out their legislation according to the standard of the owner of the earth. Where God has a problem with them is when they begin to run God's earth by a different agenda. Is someone listening to me? It's like you come to my house and I say that my, goat, my gate is closed at 10 p.m. every day. I mean locked up and the keys brought to me. And you came to my house to visit and you said to my security guard, you say, today we are not going to lock our, this, this gate at 10. We are going to lock it at 1 a.m. Who you be? If I'm nice, I will come out, I will lock my gate at 10 p.m. and I will go upstairs to sleep. If I'm not nice, I will push you outside, I will lock my gate, and I will go to sleep. Either way, my gate will be locked at 10 p.m. We are trying to run the earth that belongs to God like it belongs to us. You know, I don't want to greet my father today. Hey, I don't want to do this one tomorrow. Hey, I'm not doing that one next tomorrow. Hey, that's, I mean, I cannot, I cannot, I cannot pay tax in that land. <laughs> you are lying. You don't know what you're saying. Every man is recognized and treated. What God wants for every nation is that every man is recognized and treated with dignity, with love, and with respect according to the standard of God's code of ethics. So again, don't forget, this is not, is he born again? Is he not born again? When we say a nation is under God, it means that that nation understands that everyone, somehow, the leaders know that just because they are in Asorok, they are not better than the man in Wishing. Do you understand it? 
He knows. And so if he comes across the man in wishing, he trains the man in wishing like he will treat himself because that's the standard of God's word. If the man in wishing decides to go and steal a goat, the man, you know, they play. Think about it. The policeman is taking bribe. But if they carry you go police station, you're in trouble. That same policeman that is breaking the law, pay attention to me, is the same one that will throw you in the guard room. Am I correct? Why? Because as long as he wear that uniform, even if he's a thief in that uniform, he's representing the Federal Republic of Nigeria. That's what I'm saying. Your governor may not be the smartest person on earth today, but because he's the, he holds the seal of the governor of XYZ state, he's not only representing the government of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, he's representing the God that gave the land of Nigeria to us. So I understand very well that there are gangsters in, in leadership. That's why every day I pray for them. Their gangsterism no go do me anything. Do you understand that? That's what it is. I know somebody was like, this is really defeatist. You mean this is all we can do? No, this is not all we can do. Because that governor was raised in a house. I told you before. If the parents raised it, I saw something this afternoon. I'll not go to it. Do you know that the person who will use Ghana must go to thief money? Started by thiefing meat in his mother's soup. He just got used to stealing. So he started to steal pencils in school and we were laughing. So when they put him in charge of the treasury, what will he do? He steal because that's all he knows how to do. There's nothing like I'm just going to be a thief for 21 years. When I reach 22 years, I'm no thief again. It not go happen. When you reach 22 years, your thief will go grow. As you they grow, the teeth in, they grow. <laughs> Praise Jesus. In the Bible, for instance, you see in the account of Job chapter 3, I don't have the time to read it. In Job chapter 3 from verse 1 to verse 10, which is the entire chapter of that, of that Job, Jonah had been running. And then he got to a point where, you know, the fish... Or the, the, the Bible, no, the, the Bible did not say it's a whale. It just says it was a fish. The fish vomited him at the, in the bank of Nineveh. And God said to him, go where I sent you. Go and tell the people of Nineveh to, for, to, 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 to repent. If not, I'm coming to destroy them. I always knew that Nineveh was not a Christian nation. But today, I decided to check it out again, preparing for this message. I decided to do the research again. Is Nineveh a Christian nation? Was Nineveh a Christian nation? Do you know what I found? Nineveh was part of Assyria. It was actually like uh, the main city of Assyria. And if you have read your Bible, Assyria were the enemies of Israel all their lives. And God sent, that was why Jonah was so upset. How can you send me to go and warn Assyria to give, to, to repent and so that you will not destroy them? When you should just help us destroy Assyria. If they are cup full, destroy them. Why are we preaching to them that they should not, they should do, they should change their ways so that they will not be destroyed? It was why Jonah didn't find it funny. It was why he decided to go to Tashish instead of going to Nineveh. Someone with me. So Jonah is like some of us today. Father, just kill all of them. What's the guarantee that the next crop of them will be good? So God said to Jonah, go and preach to them. You don't run, I don't catch you, you don't come back. So now go to, go to Nineveh and tell them that I said they, will, they should repent. Again, Nineveh was not a Christian nation. Jonah went. He said, Nineveh, God said he's coming to destroy you if you don't repent. Guess what? The king of Nineveh heard and declared a fast for the entire city. All of them, they fasted. All of them wore sackcloth. All of them put ashes like with a mourning on their head. And God forgave them. <laughs> Forget so, two generations later, God wiped out Nineveh. Because they repent in Jonah's time. Then by the time they got to Nahum time, they started again. Then God said this time, nobody to warn them. Just destroy them. But in Jonah's time, 
what God wanted was that Nineveh would repent of her ways and be a nation under God. Is someone following me? Does it look like I'm speaking heresy? So, they're a wicked nation. But I don't want to destroy them yet. I want to show, give them the opportunity to repent. They repented. They changed their ways. God spared their lives. A couple of generations later, like I said, the same Nineveh went back to their ways. And in the book of Nahum, psh, how many of us remember the account of Sodom and Gomorrah? Sodom and Gomorrah were not a Christian nation or a, God, a Jewish nation or a covenant nation with God. They were a reprobate people. God said, I want to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, but I will tell Abraham. Abraham began to intercede because Abraham understood what I'm saying to us today. Abraham said, God, if you see 40 people, how far? Will you forgive them? He said, yeah, I'll forgive them. He said, if you see 30, uncle. So, what about 10? No problem. Shabir you asking me, Abraham, I don't want... It, you could see that it was God's final or God's first point of recourse is not destruction. But as Abraham interceded the rich, they couldn't find enough people. That's why Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. We don't know the Bible, so we just talk. No. Our God is predominantly, he's a God of judgment, I know. But he's also a God of mercy. The Bible says he does not desire the death of sinners, but that all may repent. So if making, getting them to become governor, and then touching them and showing them the ways how they will repent, they've got to repent. But I'm even saying, if you don't want to repent, it's your decision, right? But just be a nation under God. Praise Jesus. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, in verse number 2, 1 Timothy chapter 2, in verse number 2. It says, for kings and all who are in positions of authority or high responsibility, that outwardly we may pass a quiet and undisturbed and inwardly a peaceable one in all godliness and reverence and serious in every way. Let me read it. But oh, maybe I should have read verse 1. Verse 1 says, first of all, then, I admonish and urge that petitions, prayers, intercessions, thanksgiving be offered on behalf of all men. For kings and all who are in positions of authority or high responsibility, that what? Outwardly, we may pass a quiet and undisturbed life, and inwardly, a peaceable one in all godliness and reverence and seriousness in every way. I want you to see what the Bible is saying. The Bible is saying pray for your leaders so that you will have a quiet life, so that you will have a life of dignity. If you read it in another translation, maybe the New King James, it says that we may lead tranquil and quiet lives in godliness and in dignity. So we pray for them so that we we have what God wants us to have. Is someone listening to me? In my village, we have a saying, it means give to the thorns what the thorns want so that the thorns will clear out of your way and you can go on your merry way. God says pray for them so that you can have a tranquil and quiet life or a peaceful life so that you have a life of dignity and stability. Hey. Hallelujah. In Daniel chapter 2, in verse 21, Daniel chapter 2, a nation under God. Stabi, what are you saying? I'm saying that, look, the way it's been set up, God's original intent, we need to pray. All. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 21, he says, he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. 
He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. God changes the times. He sets up, he removes kings and he sets up new ones. If you read the scripture, if you take the Bible as literally as I take it, it means that it's not my vote that will remove someone until God wants to remove him. Unless you don't believe the Bible, but I believe Bible. If I don't believe Bible, I won't be anywhere. So I believe what the Bible says. I take it for what it says. Because the earth is the Lord's, those who rule the nations of the earth are either set up by him or they are removed by him. Consequently, the least that a leader can do is to acknowledge the principles of God as he set up for life and living and do them. And that leader and his nation will thrive. I've been in an emotional place before where I thought that, you know, only people who carry a big Bible and go to church can be our leaders and deliver. I know it sounds crazy. Many people don't want to hear this thing I'm saying. But I read my Bible. That's not, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says they just must follow. So think about it carefully. If the constitutions of the nations flow out of the Ten Commandments, Think about it carefully. When people follow, when the leaders follow the constitutions, what will they be following? Do a small, simple math, now do it. If the constitutions flow out of the standard of the Ten Commandments, when they follow the constitution to the letter, what will they be following? Eh? The word of God. The standard of God. What's the problem? If my husband is a lawyer, if you ask me, you say they don't follow the constitution. They say the law will say it this way, they will do it another way. Nobody is asking them to take a Bible and be reading it. It's only Israel that was told this every day. If you are the king of Israel, read the Bible every day. I be that he gave birth. Nobody said it to other people. So we're not saying read the Bible. We're just saying submit to the standard of David is a human being like me. If I treat him right and he treats me right, if we're neighbors, we'll have peace. I'll be passed like that. You don't pass like that now. Hallelujah. This is the most basic way a nation can be brought under God. Rulership by righteousness. Righteousness by the standard of the word of God. Because whether a leader knows it or not, whether he acknowledges it or not, no one becomes a civil authority unless God allows him to be. His real employer is not his political party or the rigging system or the political structure. His real employer is the God of heaven who leads the earth to him, a piece of the earth to him for four years or eight years that he might be the president, the governor, or whatever it is that he is. So for instance, think about it. If a hidden judge presides over, say, a murder case, that is this judge, let's say hidden is too far because the hidden believes, claims he believes in something. Let's say the 80s that says he doesn't believe in something. Hallelujah. If an 80s judge is presiding over a murder case and decides that murder is wrong. Are you with me? He decides that murder is wrong. So he sentences a murderer to jail or to whatever the punishment is in that land. How many of us know that he's done the will of God that day? Without saying Jesus, he just did the will of God. The Bible said, thou shalt not kill. <laughs> Is someone listening to me? We over-spiritualize these things, now they cause our problem. He just upheld the sixth commandment that says, thou shalt not kill. Without preaching, without putting his hand on a Bible. Maybe he doesn't even know where the Bible is. But the moment he saw that, he looked at the merits of the case, and the person was a murderer, and he, 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 um, um, he, he sentenced him accordingly. He just upheld the sixth commandment. 
thou shalt not kill. Is someone with me so far? Man was created by God in the image and likeness of God. This is fundamental truth about why, whether the person, you know, believes in God or not, the rules that bind the earth in which we live in is the standard of heaven. Because, again, you did not create the earth. Because you did not create the earth, you cannot have a say on how the earth is run. The earth cannot be run. When you create your own earth, run it by your own agenda. Right now, God is the one that created it. So how will we run it? By the agenda of God. That is the only way, quote me anywhere, that peace is going to come upon the nations. Because we know nothing. We have no clue what we're doing. But the God of heaven, the Bible says he knows all things. He knows the end of a thing from the beginning. Because we say we don't believe in God. But when the commandment of God favors us, we hold it. Eh? I mean, why if not, why we not go, all of us going to go stand for it? Say, kill me. Why if somebody carrying a knife, they pursue us, we go go call police. Say, he's trying to murder me. And he should not kill me. Why we don't say, okay, make everybody just do anything they like. It's because we're all created in the image and likeness of God, number one. Number two, we're all created to give God glory. Genesis 1, 27 and Revelation 4, 11. The time together of these two things is a fundamental truth. Your life must give God glory because he created you in, the, in his image and likeness. And in Genesis 1.28, he gave you the mandate for dominion. I've told us here before that the mandate for dominion was not given to believers. It was given to man. That meant the unbelieving man too. <laughs> all people are to worship. Number two, all people are to worship only the true God. Exodus 20 verse 3. Exodus chapter 20 verse number 3. You shall have no other gods before or besides me. Did he say again, church, you shall have no other God. Did he say it there? He's just saying to his creation, I am the Lord thy God. If you read from verse 1. Do not try me. Man is created to worship. This is a sidebar. What this means is, this is not my main thought. But with this thought, you understand half of what I'm saying today. Man is created for worship. So no matter what they say, everybody worships something. Some people worship their money. Some people worship their wives. Some people worship their husbands. Some people build some things in their house that they worship. Some people worship their car. They know they sleep for night. If they yell, go, 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 they don't jump up, look outside window. Why? Because they just buy the car. The very first brand new car that I, I got, I was not, for two weeks I no sleep. You know, if I, I no sleep, I would just imagine that I had the door open. I would jump up. I would be looking out of my window. Who won't carry my car? It wasn't even the best car in town that time. But in that one day, God said to me, I said, I said, sleep. I said, but my car is said, sleep. He said, sleep because that car has become your God. Some of us children have become our God. Oh, many of us money. Whether now say we get enough or we don't get enough, now money, now with a bottle. Everybody worships something. The atheist, the moralist worships the fact that he doesn't do wrong. Every man is created for worship. So when they run around and they say, I don't believe in God, it's, they're worshiping themselves. That's why. They put themselves on the throne. That's why they say, I don't believe in God. Why should I worship God? I don't believe in him. That's because you're worshiping yourself. The way God wired man, man must bow to something. So everywhere in the world, people bow to something. Do you get it? So everyone worships something. So there is really no secularism anywhere. What we mean when we say so we are, we are secular is that we will not acknowledge the lordship of Jesus Christ. That's what we mean. We've chosen and made a decision that we're not going to bow to God. The problem in that is that a fail, man does not have a failure to worship problem. Pay attention to me. 
man does not have a failure to worship problem because some people worship their belly. That's why no matter what in the pool for granted, they will chop them. They no matter that's you will see them, they will go to Rita Meta, they will go carry eggs where they boil for night, pool for them, they will chop them. Why? They are God is inside their belly. Do you understand that? So across the globe, man does not have a problem to, of um, um, a failure to worship problem. What man has is a failure to worship the good, the true God problem. Praise Jesus. Therefore, the expectation to worship the true God is not just for God's covenant people, but for every nation. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5. That shall worship the Lord their God, your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That's where we are. Shema came from. Do you remember? Whether you like God or you don't like God in this season, if you want to excel, you must go by his rules. Failure to worship God and, and to worship any other God brings judgment. If you fail to worship the true God and you choose to worship any other God, it brings judgment. It is another reason why we must be a nation under God. Because when we don't do God's standard, the vacuum, there are no vacuums. If we don't do the standard of God that cares for everybody and caters for everybody, we will do the standard of another person. Do you understand it? So the moment we are not doing the will of God, we are doing the will of someone else. And that will can never, never be to our, our advantage or benefit. Yes? In Romans chapter 12, Sorry, Romans chapter 1. Please go there with me. Time have I got. I'll soon be done. Romans chapter number 1. In verse 21. Hey, I can't read this. It's a lot. From verse 21. It highlights the, the gradation that comes when men and nations alike refuse to worship God. The Bible says he gives them up to a reprobate mind. The man who becomes more and more demonized is the man that refused to acknowledge God. Do you get it? Okay, I don't want to worship you, but I know you are God. It's better than I'm not. I don't even recognize that you are God. Does this make sense? It says, because when they knew and recognized him as God, they did not honor and glorify him as God or give him thanks. But instead, they became futile and godless in their thinking with vain imaginings, foolish reasoning, and stupid speculations. And their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Professing to be smart, they made simple things of themselves. And by the glory and majesty and excellence of the immortal God, we are exchanged for. And, and, and by them, the glory and majesty and excellence of the immortal God were exchanged for and represented by images representing mortal man and birds and beasts and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their own hearts to sexual impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, abandoning them to the degrading power of sin. Because they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creator rather than the creator who is blessed forevermore. For this reason, God gave them over and abandoned them to vile affections and degrading passions. For their women exchanged their natural function for an unnatural and abnormal one. And the men also turned from natural relations with women and were set ablaze, burning out, consumed with lust for one another. Men committing shameful acts with men and suffering in their own bodies and personalities the inevitable consequences and penalty of their wrongdoing and going astray, which was their fitting retribution. And so, since they did not see fit to acknowledge God or approve of him or consider him worth their knowing, God gave them over to a base and condemned mind to do things not proper or decent but loathsome until they were filled and permeated and saturated with every kind of unrighteousness. Iniquity, grasping, and covetous greed, and malice. They were filled. They were full of envy and jealousy, murder, 
strife, deceit, and treachery, ill will, and cruel wills. They were secret backbiters and gossips, slanderers, hateful to hating God, hateful to and hating God, full of insolence, arrogance, and boasting, inventors of new forms of evil, disobedient and undutiful to parents. They were without understanding, conscienceless, and faithless, heartless, and loveless, and merciless. Though they are fully aware of God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve to die, they not only do them themselves, but approve and applaud others who practice them. Where did it start from? They refuse to acknowledge the God. We cannot separate our nations from God and prosper. It will be the same as taking out the angel from a car and expecting the car to keep being a car. What makes a car the car is not the housing. What makes a car, what's, what is a car? A car is a mode of transportation. It takes you from one uh, location to another, right? What makes the car able to move? The engine. If you remove the engine and you say, see my car. No, what you have is something that we will use a box to keep things. Because it can no longer perform the what? The duties of a car. Does this make sense? When we take God out of nation building, when we take God and his standards out of community building, it is like taking the engine out of the car. We are not going anywhere, just like the box doesn't go anywhere. Is someone paying attention to me? I know you're like, Sister B, which one concerns me? <laughs> the immutability or unchangeability of God makes this very important. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, it says, For I am the Lord, I do not change. That is why you, O sons of Jacob, and not consumed. If you also check James chapter 1 verse 17, he alludes to the same thing. God is immutable. God does not change. So if he says the only way to legislate the earth is by doing his will, that's the only way to do it. God's law is useful for three things. Number one, God's law is useful to awaken the sinner to his sins and the impending judgment that is coming. Number two, God's law is the standard for believers to walk in sanctification and holiness. Number three, God's law exists so that we can restrain sin from society. If we limit God's law to just living holy lives, but we do not extend it to restraining sin from society, who suffers? You and me. God's law is enough to restrain strain, sin, but government is the enforcer of this restraint. As we saw in Romans 13, verse 1 to 5. So God will raise men and women, put them in positions of authority, so that they will enforce thou shalt not steal. So that they will enforce thou shalt not commit murder. Recently, I saw a news item where someone was asked to pay a fine because they committed adultery. And the husband of the woman, or so, so they said, went to court. Did anybody ever think that courts would punish someone who committed adultery? We are, people have just been doing it and going back and forth now. Shebi, am I correct? That man was not the first person that committed adultery. Am I correct? But courts said he should pay, I think, whether 5 million, 50 million, I don't know what they asked him to pay as fine for committing adultery with someone's wife. Where did the Bible, where did he first say that you should not convert your neighbor's wife? In the Bible, under the Ten Commandments. The, these things exist so that sin can be restrained from society. If we can curtail and restrain sin from society, our societies will begin to thrive. Go with me to Psalm, uh, Psalm 33 verse 8 as I'm rounding up. Psalm 33 verse number 8. Psalm 33 verse number 8. 
Let all the earth fear the Lord. Revere and worship him. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. Did he qualify or did disqualify the kind of inhabitants? The Christian one, the Muslim one, the Hindu one. Who? All. Go with me to Psalm 117. Psalm 117. I want to read to you, I believe it's verse number one. Psalm 117 in verse 1. It says, praise the Lord, O you nations. Praise him, all you people. Did he say the people who live in a, in a, in a Bible-believing state? Who? All the nations, all the people. Go to Psalm 72, verse 11. Psalm 72, verse number 11. Yes, O kings. All kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. Somebody is saying, show me an example. How many of us have ever read our Daniel chapter 4? Who remembers the account in Daniel chapter 4? The story of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar woke up one day and said, look at all this nation. I built it by myself. It's by my wisdom. Then he went to sleep. He had a dream. And in that dream, he saw. He did not understand what he saw. He called Daniel and said, I dreamt. I need you to interpret what I dreamt. Daniel said, what did you dream? He explained the dream. Daniel said, oh, king, now you. The Lord is warning you, if you don't change your ways, he's going to debase you very soon. Then we can then say, I've heard. After a few weeks, he forgot. One day, he woke up again. I was, people were talking to him. Oh, hey, king, you are very smart. He looked and said, you are, you are very correct. Out of all the world, I'm the most, you know, I'm the best king. I'm the greatest king. I'm the this one. I did this by myself. Boom! The Bible said, all of a sudden, he found himself in the, in the, in the bush, eating grass, walking on all fours, like an animal. How long? Seven solid years. Until, he, by the time he started to testify, I want to read his testimony. Because who no go? No go, no. Let's read from Nebuchadnezzar where he go. Daniel chapter 4. He went, he went now. Did he not go? <laughs> Let's look at it. Let's look at it. Verse 34, at the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my understanding returned to me and I blessed the most high and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion. And his kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven. And among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand. Or say to him, what have you done? At the same time, my reason returned to me. And for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and spirit splendor returned to me. My counselors and nobles resorted to me. I was restored to my kingdom and excellent majesty was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol the honor and honor the king of heaven, all of whose works are truth and his ways justice. And those who walk in pride, he's able to put down. This is his testimony. Nowhere did he say that he became, he converted to Judaism. Nowhere did he say he became a Jew. He just said that for the first time, he acknowledged that there is someone greater. 
And the moment he did that, he was restored. A nation under God doesn't necessarily have to have Christian leaders. It just needs to have leaders who recognize that the earth was delegated to them and their positions, they got to because God made room for them. And they understand that there is a standard that God is set. The basics of that standard is that we must be good human beings. This does not take a degree. You don't need to go to Harvard. You don't need to be educated. You don't need to be able to speak English. You, don't, you just need to recognize that that man was created in the image and likeness of God. The way I'm created in the image and likeness of God. I am created to give glory to God. That man is created to give glory to God. So I will treat him as I want to be treated. It's very easy to be a nation under God. But it begins by acknowledging that the God of heaven is the God and he's the king of all things. Let's rise on our feet. Let's speak to God. I know you are not the whatever, whatever. But speak to God this morning. You pray, you pray, you pray. Father Lord, in the name of Jesus, wherever you send me, whether you just send me as the supervisor in a company where I'm resuming tomorrow, or you send me as the teacher to go and be in charge of the children tomorrow, or whether you send me as the boss to start a company, a, a, you know, a, an international organization that employs thousands of people. Wherever you release me, oh God, may I represent you in the name of Jesus. May I represent you. I want to contribute my quota to make this nation a nation under God. I will contribute my quota to make this nation a nation under God. I will contribute my quota to make this nation, a nation under God. Help me, oh God. In Jesus' mighty name. If you're on this, if you're here and you're yet to give your life to Jesus, or maybe you're online, but you're yet to give your life to Jesus, it's a good day to give your life to Jesus. How do you do that? You have to first of all believe that Jesus is the Son of God who came in the flesh to do one thing and one thing alone, to restore you and to redeem you. And to be able to accept that gift from the Father, you have to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. So this, month, this evening, if you're yet to give your life to Jesus, pray with me. And you want to do so, pray with me. And I believe that you should do so. And say with me, Lord Jesus, I give you my life. Lord Jesus, I give you my life. As simple as that prayer sounds. You have given your life to Jesus. This is the journey, the beginning of your journey to becoming a nation under God. The rest of us, let's bring out our communion and let's thank God for the opportunity to partake of the table. And as we break our bread in the name of God the Father, in the name of God the Son, and in the name of God the Holy Spirit, as we eat, may the God of heaven multiply his strength and his grace and his wisdom in us. That we will be contributors to nations under God. Wherever we go, we will add. We will not subtract, subtract as we eat in Jesus' name. Lord, as we partake of your, of your blood, of the cup of your blood, we ask, oh God, that the work of redemption will kick in. And indeed, we will be proponents of nations under God. In Jesus' name. God bless you.